Hey everybody, this is Ray Patelsch, and this is episode 24 of Have Not Seen This, a weekly in-depth look at a much-beloved movie, selected specifically by our guest. They're a little surprised when they find out people have not seen. Hope everybody is having a good week out there. I've been a little on the downside lately. I keep going back to that John Hodgman quote that I referred to back in, I think it was episode five. Uh, and, and so you don't have to go back just to, to give you a clip of the quote. He said, normally I consider nostalgia to be a toxic impulse. It is the twinned yearning delusion that the past was better. It wasn't. And it can be recaptured. It can't. And I think one of the triggers I've been having for kind of feeling down lately is the other podcast that I produce, uh, Citizens of Azeroth, because John Hodgman also says, always be plugging. Um, we've been looking back at the past, uh, specifically looking at the different expansions that have come out for World of Warcraft over the years. And that's been a lot of fun to go back and look at the state of the game over the course of its seven expansions, but it's been really hard for me to go back and think about the past without thinking about where I was in life during those times. And, you know, the last so many years haven't gone exactly the way I'd like. I mean, I probably that's true for everybody. I, I don't know anybody who has their life turn out exactly the way it's planned, but I've been married. I've been divorced. Uh, I've, I had a kid. Uh, I met who I thought was the, the new love of my life and had my heart broken by that. Uh, I started a, a teaching career. I ended a teaching career all over the course of these seven expansions that we've been talking about. And it's been kind of hard for me to not think about those aspects of my life as we revisit the past. And I, I certainly don't think it was better or that it, that it can be recaptured, as Hodgman's quote says, but there is still something toxic about that level of nostalgia. And I've been having a hard time coping with that. And I'm not going to try and talk a bunch about depression on my show, but depression is a, a facet of my life. It is something that I've had to come to terms with over the last decade in particular. I'm sure that it impacted me a lot further back than that, and I just didn't recognize it. So if you're like me and you're feeling a little down, just try to focus on the positive stuff. And for me, one of those positive things is getting to do this podcast, getting to have conversations about fun movies or good movies or movies that maybe I don't like, but the other person does and get to know other people. A lot of the people that I've had on this show at this point are people I did not know prior to sitting down and having this conversation with them. So that becomes a, a good thing for me. It's also become a lot of work, and I'm trying not to focus on that part, just trying to focus on the positivity. So part of this podcast is, of course, that each week on Friday, I post a Friday inquiry, a question inspired by or related to that week's movie. And last week, you heard us talk several many times about Strange Days and the difficulty in acquiring a copy of that film. It is not available on streaming and it is out of print on DVD. So the Friday inquiry this week was, what's a movie you've had trouble scoring a copy of? And... It just shows me how little I know what I'm doing with these things, because I really thought this was a topic that at best I would get two or three responses to. And instead, a slew of former guests on this show chimed in with movies that they've had issues finding. And it actually brought a conversation about that made me look at this even differently than I had been before. So let me look at the responses and then I'll kind of share some of my thoughts on it. Uh, over on Facebook, where we can be found at Have Not Seen This Podcast, one of my friends, Drew Meyer, chimed in with Kafka on DVD. Then we get a bunch of former guests. Uh, James Rodriguez said, Memories of Murder is only available in the UK in an out-of-print DVD selling for at least £50. Pounds. Otherwise, good luck watching the film. It can't even be streamed or rented over here. And then he came back a little later saying, here's another Bong Joon-ho one, Snowpiercer. Never got a UK theatrical or home media release, and no explanation has been given about why. We only got it available to rent and stream last year with no physical copy yet available. 
Uh, Johanna chimed in with, All Hazard Balthazar still haven't gotten a DVD or stream. Thomas Mariani said, For our show, Double Edge, Double Bill, plug, 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 uh, the obscure bad movies are always the trickiest. Glitter, Invasion USA, Wired, and many others are swept under the rug by their current copyright owners from streaming slash being in print and with good reason. Laura Huber said, as an old movie fan, my unobtainable is Tovarich, a marvelous movie with Claudette Colbert and Charles Boyer. No v- DVD and no love from TCM or AMC, even just playing it so I can tape it. And Kat Milner said, when the craft was taken off streaming, I went to look for it and found it was out of print. Couldn't have that, so I bought a used one off a thrift book and movie site. Over on Twitter, where we can be found at Have Not Seen This... Chris Talent chimed in with one I haven't been able to find streaming anywhere is the old 70s movie The Heartbreak Kid with Sybil Shepard. But to be fair, I haven't looked in years. And the Kunkka said Bugsy Malone. Luckily, it came out on Apple Movies and I got it for five dollars. So a couple of things. One, these were movies that were difficult to find. In a couple of cases, they have been made available, such as Bugsy Malone. Uh, for some of these, they're just hard to find. But what I hadn't even considered when I raised this topic was the fact that you have international markets to deal with as well. For instance, James is having trouble finding two Bong Joon-ho movies. Snowpiercer is available on Netflix in the United States and has been for as long as I can remember since it initially came out. It hasn't been pulled from Netflix. I just checked after I commented on him that it was here the other day, and it is still on Netflix. So... That's something I hadn't even considered, that movies that are readily available here may not be overseas and vice versa. And uh, Thomas, again, from Double Edge, Double Bill, I give you a shout out in the episode or I give you a reference in the episode. I don't think I get called your show out by name and I apologize for that. So there's your your extra cred there. So some really interesting movies there, some I haven't seen or even heard of, and maybe that's why, which just goes to fuel the case that I was making last week with that element is, you know, we live in a time where streaming movies has become the norm, and yet we have a a large selection of films that aren't readily available. And I'm very curious as to how studios are going to deal with that when they have a movie that maybe isn't mainstream maybe doesn't have the biggest audience, but still has some people out there who would like to see it. So I guess we'll see as time will tell. Again, I'm really curious also as to how Disney Plus is going to contend with the fact that they have this library of R-rated films, uh, especially ones from Fox, that don't fit the Disney Plus dynamic, but should still be made available on streaming somehow. All right, let's turn our eyes to this week and lighter fare. We've got a great 1980s comedy this week, One Crazy Summer, a John Cusack movie that I had not seen prior to preparing for this episode. Uh, I had a couple of Cusack movies that had somehow eluded me, uh, even though I really kind of connected growing up with John Cusack in his films. Somehow, this one and Better Off Dead, I had not seen until my more adult years. And when I saw Better Off Dead, I didn't like it, as I I talk a little bit about in the episode. So when I discovered that One Crazy Summer is a reunion with the director and actor of that movie, I kind of had some trepidation about sitting down and watching One Crazy Summer, but it did not disappoint. So... Uh, Thanks to Michael Copeland, who's my guest this week. Uh, He's not a podcaster. He doesn't have another podcast to promote, so you kind of get a break from the rash of that that I've had going on lately. He was a uh, guild friend of mine in World of Warcraft before I moved guilds uh, in between the time that we recorded this back in January and it airing now. But uh, Michael has some great things to say about One Crazy Summer. We talk a lot about school for some reason. Can't imagine why we would talk about that with a movie that, you know, takes place at the end of a school experience. And uh, you'll get a little bit of insight into my past as a student and as a teacher. So here we go. 1986's One Crazy Summer. (laughs) And what are you? You're studying engineering? No, I am a data analyst, so it's advanced data analytics is my master's program. Right. Oh, my God. That's – how much of that is math? 
Uh, decent amount. My focus is in statistics, so I use math a lot, but it's not overly complicated math. It's like re regressions and things like that. So there's a standard formula for every situation and, you know, not a lot of variance, pun intended, because variance is a statistical property, but there's not a lot of <laughs> plugging in, having to do my own thing. Right. I took when I went back to college to get my English degree because um, I had I had gone under general studies and then I had gone under broadcasting and finally went for a real degree. Uh, that was what was recommended to me to take since it had been so much time between high school and me going to college for real. Mm -hmm. They said you should take statistics because it's basically just plugging the numbers into the formula, just learning how to use the formulas and plug them in and, and then do the math. Yeah. I mean, if you can use Excel, it, you're already halfway there. Everything that I do can pretty much be plugged into an Excel plugin. Yeah. So I, I loved statistics just because it was so easy compared to learning higher math. Yeah. That's what I'm banking on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do you do with a degree in, in as a data analyst? Well, the I mean, the obvious thing is data analysis. Uh, what I'm kind of looking is there's a – it's called exploratory data analysis, and you take a bunch of raw data, and you look for meaningful trends. So, for example, one of the data sets I worked with for the semester was some data from a store, and they had their shipping data. They had customer ID, who purchased what, how many times, when, when discounts were open, when discounts weren't open, uh, where it was, things were shipped to. How many things were shipped to what city? And you look for, for meaningful things. For example, one of the correlations I found is that they were losing money on furniture sales in the Midwest because they had an average discount of 20% or higher. So anywhere else, they weren't offering nearly that high of discount and they were making bank. But it was just that one place they decided to overly discount their product and demand wasn't even that high. So they were selling at a huge loss. And it's just exploring the numbers to find things like that and then offer solutions for the problem. It's kind of what I'm looking to do. Gotcha. Okay. That sounds like in our time and, and place in the world that that would actually be in pretty high demand. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm not going to have the unit right, but I believe it's 2 million petabytes of data are made a day. Okay. I, I know gigabytes and terabytes. What's a petabyte? It's huge. <laughs> like, I, mean, I don't know how, how to describe it other than that how much data is made in a day I do know I can quote this 98% of all the data in the world was made in the last two years that doesn't surprise me we are so data driven these days yeah. it, it almost it almost frustrates me but I know I know there's benefits to it as well but it, it almost frustrates me that we become so dependent upon that instead of instinct or I, I don't know <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't know if the petabyte was right, but I, I just Googled it. It's 2.5 quintillion bytes are created a day. Jeez. So you figure the data that I went through in that sales data sheet was approximately 20 gigabytes. So less than one, one I would say one ten thousandth of a fraction of what is made in a day. It took me a semester to properly analyze. So a lot of what we do in this field is also AI learning. Uh, we use things like Apache Hadoop, which is a, a data lake and a data system to take large amounts of raw data and structure it into a, a database that we can query. So it's basically just a bunch of techniques for trying to deal with this huge flow of data. And you're right. It is everywhere today. You can't really get around it. Yeah, no, it's – and as I said, I mean like when I was a teacher, it, it drove me nuts because the focus became data-driven instruction. Mm -hmm. which too many administrators don't know how really how to use. They just like the flash word, flash phrase there of data-driven instruction. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to go into it. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> All right. So we're here today to talk about One Crazy Summer from 1986, mm -hmm. uh, written and directed by Savage Steve Holland, starring John Cusack, Demi Moore, Kimberly Foster, Joel Murray, Curtis Armstrong, Tom Villard, and Bobcat Goldthwait. The movie started! The movie's done! Not really, I just want them to come running in from the lobby thinking that they missed something. Ha! I'm Ed Stewart, movie star, also known as Bobcat Goldthwait, and me and my friends John Cusack and Demi Moore. I hate 
boats. I'm not getting on any boat. I beg to differ. Just had one crazy summer. Your dad said you were collecting shells. Shells? 57 millimeter. We did all the normal things people do. Hey, little boy, will you hold on to this for me? Mad friends. Sorry. Oh, no. Saw the sights. Please, your enormous is anything but chilly. Killed our own food. Dazzled women. Ah! Are you ready for me, Hoops? We were party animals. Help me. Everyone loved us. My car. And we loved every minute. I felt a little bit better about who I was and where I was going. Okay, let's move it out. Here we go. Wait. It really was one crazy summer. And so my first question is, how, how do you describe this movie to someone who has not seen it? Oh, man. You know, I actually thought about this question coming up, and I'm glad you asked it. Uh for me, One Crazy Summer is that quintessential coming-of-age story. You've got a young man who is relatively successful. He's as successful as society requires him to be. He's past high school. He's graduated. He has at least one marketable skill, but he still feels lost. He doesn't know what he's going to do because he failed the only aspiration that his parents had for him, which was to get into college on a basketball scholarship, hence the nickname Hoops. And so he's trying to struggle to make his one marketable talent a reality, but he doesn't understand how to use it properly because they've given him a prompt he doesn't know how to work with. So the whole movie is him going on this kind of journey of self-discovery on who he really is and not who his parents wanted him to be. I like that phrase, as successful as society requires him to be, because it's it's almost an acknowledgement that he's an underachiever. But yet he is a success in some regards. <laughs> right. Well, it's because, you know, in school, all you got to do is that common core. That's it. That's the, the two words I hate the most when it comes to the academia. Common core. Everyone does the same thing. They get spit right out. And it's good luck if you can make it or not. Right. And this movie predates that concept. That hasn't always been how school has worked. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting take because it's not quite how I would describe the movie. So that's uh, that's I, I like that that take on it. So out, out of all the movies that are out there, uh, why One Crazy Summer as your as your pick? Well, you know, my mom showed this movie to me. I want to say when I was ten or eleven, and I loved the animation of it. I'm a huge animation fan. I, I like animations of a variety of styles from a variety of time periods and places. So. That grabbed me very quickly, but it was almost relatable. Through all of school, I was lazy in the sense that I did exactly what was required, but no more. Like, yeah, I got in trouble, and this goes back to kindergarten. I almost failed kindergarten because one of <laughs> my units was coloring, and the teacher was failing me because instead of coloring, I would draw a line. In the section <laughs> of the color, because I didn't want to do more than that. <laughs> so I related to this, I do as much as you need and not a drop more. Which ties into that underachiever concept I was talking about a second right. ago. Yeah, I was the um, I was the essential, and I can't even count how many times I heard it, but I was the essential, you'd, you'd be so successful if you just apply yourself. And yeah. I, I heard that throughout school like i was a i i had trouble with homework because my feeling was if i could show that i could do it in class and if i could show i could do it on a test then what purpose did homework serve exactly i actually butted heads with one of my math teachers in the second grade because i did all the work in my head and she would accuse me of cheating on every test because i didn't i wouldn't show my work right so i uh, uh i was you know a pretty pretty average student through high school and then my senior year i just i don't know what clicked but i finally went okay you know what they say i can be successful if i just apply myself let's let's see how that actually goes and suddenly i was an a student just because i was finally buckling down and doing the work uh, i i was always capable of doing it i always could you know prove it on tests but for some reason i just personally i had an issue with homework and so I, I guess I fell into the underachiever category in, in that regard. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we lose a lot of people there. 
Yeah, it's interesting that you, you say relatable. I, I made the comment on a previous episode of the podcast that John Cusack has almost always been like my on-screen avatar. Like I connect so much with things that he – with the way he acts in movies. Yeah, the things he portrays. Exactly. And, and so like I, I'm a huge fan of Say Anything and High Fidelity almost took me out of commission for a month because – I just got so mired down in analyzing my past relationships and was I the problem like he was in that. So somehow I missed this movie from his filmography. I, I never saw I, – I was aware of One Crazy Summer. I tended to get it really confused with Summer School. For some reason, those two films just mixed up in my head, and I had never seen it until you brought it to the show. I'm glad I could bring it. Did you enjoy it? I did. I I, I did. I mean it's – it's silly in it it doesn't need the broad comedy that it has, but at the same time I'm happy that it's there. I, I found it very predictable, but then it would throw a curveball. Like there were so many aspects of, of the movie that like you could see the punchline coming. Like yeah. they're having trouble with the motorboat engine and the bad guy shows up in his Ferrari. They're gonna use that engine for their motorboat engine. Like that's predictable. But like all of the little elements that went together to to make the Godzilla joke work. <laughs> I love that scene so much. <laughs> I didn't see that coming, and I laughed my ass off because of it. Be because <laughs> even though it was – like as soon as Bobcat Goldthwait is putting on the Godzilla suit, you know it's going to get stuck on him. Like that's predictable. Right. But – the culmination of that with the little model village that has been a, a set piece throughout the film, I, I just never connected that this was going to end up being Godzilla going on a rampage through a little model village. It, it, and I laughed my ass off over it. It was a great scene. Yeah. So uh, not everybody's crazy about the movie. Critically, it hasn't – it's not bad, but it's not great. It currently sits at 56% on Rotten Tomatoes. It has a 63% audience score. Uh, and it's only at 47% at Metacritic. Just to pull in a couple of reviews, because I always try to bring in a good and a bad. Uh, the reviews for this one were kind of hard to find, I guess, because it's from that 80s period that a lot of those reviews haven't made it online, I guess, for good reason. But So the positive review comes from TV Guide, which doesn't have a credited writer. It's just a staff writer, I guess. And the review reads, Director Savage Steve Holland fills this film with so many throwaway gags that it's impossible to communicate the outright zaniness. Every scene contains dozens of jokes, some that work and some that don't, but they keep coming so fast and furious that the duds are easily forgotten. Strung together on the flimsiest of plots, Holland's film works as well as it does because he stocks it with several likably eccentric characters. While certainly not for all tastes, its refreshing teenage fare and underlying its carny insouciance is a welcome touch of innocence. On the flip side, Nina Darton of the New York Times writes, There are all kinds of movies. Movies that entertain that frighten, that excite, that thrill, that move, that make you laugh, and that make you think. One Crazy Summer cannot be accused of being any of these, although there are a few jokes in which you might find yourself smiling. In fact, the film is so successful at turning your brain into something resembling mashed potatoes that it is not clear when you'll be able to respond to intelligible stimuli again. Oh, harsh. That may be its point. This mindless romp written and directed by Savage Steve Holland, whose last film was Better Off Dead, is a string of set-up punchlines. It is the ultimate luxury for the kid who has everything, a film that means nothing. Oh, my heart. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, the, the negative reviews sometimes – I've talked about this on the podcast before. Negative reviews are fun to write, but they don't take into account the work that people put into something. Yeah. The other film that I had had absent from my John Cusack knowledge was uh, the, the predecessor to this, Better Off Dead, which is from the same director and also stars John Cusack. And my ex-wife showed it to me. She was she remembers it with great fondness. And one night she insisted we sit down and watch it. And I hated it. It was terrible. And that's why she's my ex-wife. No, I'm just kidding. Um <laughs> I mean, even when it ended, even she went, yeah, that was be better in my memory than it is in reality. But this one holds up really well. Yeah, I'm glad you say that because I was kind of dreading this. You know, during the break, I was like, well, you know, I'm, I said this movie is great and it's one of my favorites, but I haven't watched it in five years. 
So I sat down today to watch it, and I was like, wow, it's as great as I remember. I laughed at every joke. I've laughed at, and I actually got some more jokes that I didn't get, you know, as a teenager. Oh, and as a sure. Child. <laughs> and I had a blast rewatching it, and I was so glad that it lived up to my nostalgia. Yeah, uh, yeah, I have n- no doubt that that you got more jokes now than you did when you were younger. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's it it really is. I I think the reviews, both of those reviews, talk about just how many jokes are thrown at you, a- and it is, it is. It is nonstop. And some of them aren't great. Like the sequence where they've buried um, Gordon in the sand Mm -hmm. and all of the things that happened to this to him with just his head stuck out and that, you know, the dog comes and pees on him. And then I don't remember what happened next. And then, of course, it culminates in the guy sitting in the chair above him and eating food and and the ultimate of fart jokes. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't really appeal to me yeah especially because it was predictable but some of the other jokes it, but as they said it, it's so so many gags being thrown at you at the same time because that's being intercut with other stuff going on like yeah. at the same time that that's going on you have uh the girls come up and ask them to help with the boat help move the boat right mm-hmm and Bobcat Goldthwait's little under his breath comments about, are you sure you don't have something heavier for us to carry or, or, you know, that kind of like that was making me laugh. So the fact that Gordon's head sticking out of the sand wasn't making me laugh, it balanced out. It wasn't yeah. a problem. So I guess you should talk just a, a little bit. I, I've, I've already kind of talked about some of the gags, but you have two plot lines going on here. The instigating one, which really ends up not being very important, is that our, our main character, played by John Cusack, Hoops, uh, has to come up with an essay about love. He's graduated from high school, from generic high school. Oh, my God. That's one of my favorite visual gags. <laughs> In generic, generic high school New York. generic elementary. <laughs> uh so he's graduated and he as you mentioned he doesn't get the basketball scholarship because repeating gag is he cannot throw something into a hoop to save his life uh you don't even realize the importance of that in the first scene where he's throwing trash at the trash can but from the very first scene that's a continuing gag that he just can't throw anything in and so he has to write this essay or i guess illustrate this essay because it's it's essentially got to be a storyboard Mm -hmm. Uh, for admission to an arts college. And to get away from generic New York, he follows his friend Gordon to uh, Nantucket. So you have that going on. And along the way, they encounter a very hippie-esque girl, I guess is the best way to describe her. Uh, Cassandra, played by Demi Moore, a very young Demi Moore, who I almost didn't recognize at first who uh her family her i guess the the patriarch of the family has died and the house has to have back payments made or the bank is going to foreclose on the mortgage so you have that kind of ends up taking the spotlight this fight for the house with john cusack and his friends on one side and preppy guys and gals on the other side now i would say that the main plot there doesn't actually take a backseat. I felt that it was per, uh, balanced well because he's looking for love with Cookie, and he ultimately finds it when he stops looking and starts helping someone he genuinely likes. And I felt like they did a good job of weaving them together. I I, I can see that. I, I don't necessarily agree. I mean, I even made that note at one point in my notes as I'm making my way through the movie that, you know, he's helping – I think it's when they're doing the boat, when they're making up the boat for the culminating boat race, Mm -hmm. that, yes, he's helpful. He has these friends. He and Cassandra are growing closer, but he hasn't mentioned or worked on this essay at all for the longest time of the movie. And I, the part of the reason I feel like his, his need to do this essay kind of fizzles out, despite being the instigating event, is that the movie ends without us knowing whether he got into college. You know, you make a valid point, and I hadn't thought about this, but there is a very long period of time be- before he does another little animation sequence. Yeah, there's there's a big block in between. The, and, and you're saying animated sequence. If you haven't seen the movie, uh, when Hoops is working on this essay, it's presented to the audience as an animated story that he is narrating. 
Uh, it's actually how the film opens with Once Upon a Time and this rhino that he likes to draw, which kind of, rep he, I guess, represents himself, is trying to find love and is having obstacles put in his path by a group of fuzzy bunnies. <laughs> the fuzzy bunnies. I'm sorry, that get, they get me every time. Oh yeah, no, that's they were funny. And I, I one of the notes that I made early on is, you know, who did this animation because it was in a style that looked very familiar to me. Very Fritz the Cats, right? Yeah, it was in this style that's very familiar. Well, it's done by Savage Steve himself. Savage Steve Holland did the animation. Oh wow. So it's I don't think that's the primary plot as much as the we need the money, you know, we got to raise money to save the farm or to save, in this case, the house is kind of becomes the more central plot point. And it's very 80s in, in that regard. You, as I said, it's the preppies are the bad guys, the misfits are the good guys. Uh, it even has Curtis Armstrong, who was in Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> you know, you've you've got quite the cast of characters on John Cusack's side. You know, you've got Joel Murray. You've got Bobcat Goldthwait, you've got Tom Villard, you've got Curtis Armstrong, and almost all of these are very recognizable faces, but seeing them together is quite entertaining. They have good synergy with their little different quirks that the characters were portraying. They do, and I had not seen Bobcat do much on screen it from this era other than the Police Academy movies. That was my introduction to him. He was more of a stand-up comedian at this point, and and you know had he he kind of burst into the spotlight because of his role in the Police Academy movies. I still love some of his stand-up from this point. Today, he's more behind the scenes. He does less on-screen stuff, but like the last Patton Oswalt special that is on Netflix, I believe where he's doing comedy, but at one point he gets serious because he has to address the death of his wife. And he, when he announced the special, he said he he could not have done it without trusting in Bobcat Goldthwait's hands as a producer, that that's how much Bobcat means to him. And wow. he knew that in his hands, the tone of the piece would end up being exactly what it needed to be. So... It's kind of funny to look at his origins, you know, with a movie like this and then know now that he's a very trusted and respected name in comedy, even if he's not getting up on stage anymore. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So. So, yeah. So the raising of the money, I think, is the primary plot line. I mean, I, the, definitely the the essay is a part of the movie. There's no arguing that. But I just don't think it's as essential a part of the movie once it gets the plot going. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, it makes a very valid point. But you've also, without that, if you didn't have the raising money plot line going on, you wouldn't get such good bad guys. Uh, you know, it gives you an actual adversary for this group of people to ha to face off against rather than it just being this idea of can I find love. Yeah. Oh, and what good bad guys they are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt Mulhern plays Teddy, who is just the quintessential 80s prep <laughs> complete with the flipped collar on his polo shirts and you know what's more important than anything else he's got to do his his laps oh my gosh the laps yeah it just cracked me up how often that came up you know his dad could be yelling at him for anything and i gotta do my laps <laughs> i don't know if they ever mentioned i don't think they did that like, there was no point for the laps other than exercise as far as i know yeah no i i don't think so either and his, his dad's outrageous hatred of lobsters. Uh, that's one of my favorite untold stories, I think. And I, this may just be my interpretation, but I think his father is in the lobster restaurant business purely because he hates lobsters. He takes too much pleasure from listening to them boil alive and shooting them with the crossbow for it to just be a business, you know? Well, and that was my note that I made is when a character is introduced using a stethoscope to hear a lobster scream when boiled, <laughs> that's the bad guy. Like, there's no <laughs> doubt. And this is played by Mark Metcalf. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, there's no doubt from the second he appears on screen, he's the bad guy. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's literally what's going on when he first is introduced. Uh, it, some genre fans may recognize the name Mark Metcalf, but probably won't recognize his face because he appeared as the master in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but he was always under such heavy prosthetic makeup that you couldn't really make out 
the actor's face underneath. But that's who the bad guy here is, is, you know, the, the master of all vampires from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> so, you know, some of these gags just crack me up. They're like uh, Uncle Frank and his contest. Oh, my God. His room is so dingy. That's one of the things I noticed is they did a really good job of setting that up as a room that is never left. Oh yeah, and then later when it's uh, when when Akak is looking for a place to live, and they say he could he could put his stuff in Uncle Frank's room, he probably won't even notice. I'm like, I don't think that's where you want to be. <laughs> <laughs> but like the the gag with him, you know, the, the idea being that he's he's devoted to listening to the radio because they're giving away a million dollars at some point over the summer, and he's not going to leave his radio until he's heard that they're giving it away and and can call in. And he's got to take a bath. And as soon as he's plugging that radio in with the extension cord, again, it's very predictable. You know where this is going. Right. But that doesn't take away from the humor of it because the, the result ends up being so hyperbolic compared to what I expected. I expected he'd get zapped, not blown out a window. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's funny because they did such a good job with this character that – when I see him get blown out the window, the only thing that pops in my mind is he's probably pissed that he's not back by the radio. Because you know right. he's just going to get to shore and get right back to the radio. That's all he cares about. Right. The the second that he gets out of the water, that's that's the first place he's going. It's like, oh, God, the contest. I got to get back to the – you know that. They don't have to show it because you know that. Hi guys, I'm Simon. And I'm Matt. And together we host a podcast called, well, Heist Podcast, where we talk about heists. We go into the world of heists and the people behind them discussing heists in the news and the biggest, most famous heists from history. Historical heists, epic heists, movie heists, all the heists. You name it, whether it's stealing moon rocks, millions of dollars, or I think one time we even discussed meatballs being stolen from someone's garage. If you love to hear about the minds and the characters of the people who pull off these amazing heists, give us a listen. We're Heist Podcast. Check us out on Heist. So you do have uh, hoops looking for romance and the obvious direction that he's going to go is to the cute yuppie girl cookie as you said who happens to be you know teddy's girlfriend mm -hmm. and yet that doesn't stop them from going out on a date despite the fact that hoops knows it's a bad move and says it's a bad move and says he shouldn't do it he still goes on the date which is a good way of bringing that conflict between the two characters i also i feel like that goes back to him being lost because he said that he wasn't going to do it, but when she showed up at the door, he couldn't stand up for himself. He doesn't have a sense of agency. He's just not comfortable with where he is in the world because he, he just lets other people choose for him. Like he let his parents choose the, the basketball scholarship. He hasn't come into being himself yet. That's a really good point because he – there's so much in this – I mean I, I don't even know that he ever breaks out of that because once he's finally – run down by Teddy, how do they resolve it? A basketball contest that Cassandra talks him into doing. Mm -hmm. He doesn't make that choice. Once they're raising money for Cassandra and they have to do the boat race, they need someone to captain the boat, and he ends up doing it. Why? Because his friends have decided for him. So I'm not sure he even grows out of that. That's a really interesting point. I feel like he does near the end, but it's... I can't say that it was expressly stated or shown. That's kind of more of like, a, I want to believe that in the, the final animation, when he's talking about love, I want to believe that he's now comfortable with being himself because he has realized that there's more to life than basketball or just animation. You know, there's things that he can do for other people. There's things that he can do for himself that it doesn't have to be so one-sided against the world. Yeah. Well, and that, and that, decision for him to do stuff for someone else comes in the form of him realizing he screwed up with Cassandra when he goes on that date, you know, and it's because he doesn't go see Cassandra perform at the do drop in. And so to, to make it up for her, to help her out, she, he creates the art for the announcement for the advertisement, I guess, for her upcoming concert. Mm -hmm. And I loved those flyers they were handing out. I mean, one, they were a heck of a lot better than her 
you know, typewriter, <laughs> three lines. Her haiku of an advertisement. Yeah, but I, I don't even know there was a haiku, but yeah, I mean, that's essentially what it was. Good point. But it also, I, I grew up near a college town, and there's like, you would see posters up for bands that were performing in that concert town. And one of them always used artwork to kind of draw attention to their posters. I still remember the band name to this day. They were called Yams from Outer Space. Oh my and God. it and it wasn't the name of the band that stuck with me as much or that got my attention as much as the crazy artwork they would use. And so when he's handing out these flyers, which are done up in a much more exaggerated style and they're very artistic, you know, that just reminded me of that. that yeah, that's how you get people's attention. That's how you get people to come out for a concert. I also I feel like that was the point where he really committed to animation like i know that he was good at it and but i feel like at the beginning of the movie if you kind of look at the subtext he's looking at animation because he's good at it and because basketball fell through i don't feel like he's chosen that for himself it's just the next possible option that's a good point too that would that would also go along with his the the kind of the way you're characterizing him you know that he he does what he's told other people make the decisions for him and he's not choosing animation as much as falling back on it. And it isn't until he does the stuff for Cassandra that he's making an active choice about it. Right. Yeah. I can go with that interpretation. So one of the repeating gags that we, we've got to talk about mm -hmm. is Gordon's little sister, Squid. <laughs> that dog. And that dog, which the before we even meet Squid, we are reminded not to say anything about the dog. Like Hoops is flat out told, just don't say anything about the dog. And when we see the dog, we immediately know why, because it's this mutt with that protective cone around its neck. Yeah, Bosco, Bosco's the name of the dog. Bosco yeah, has Bosco. mange, parts of Bosco is shaved, the tail looks crooked. Yes. It's a sad excuse for a dog, but she loves that dog with all of her heart. Oh, yeah. And and anybody who messes with the dog, which happens, you know, several times in the movie, uh, they they get their comeuppance. My my favorite being the two gas attendant mm -hmm. people who come over and are looking through the car window and making fun of the dog. And grandma decides she's waited too long and she's going to take off. And the little girl rolls up the window on their ties so that they have to run alongside the car because they made fun of her dog. It's very sadistic, but she's just so cute. That makes it work. Oh, yeah. And, and so I knew when you get to the point where our, our main bad guy, again, played by Mark Metcalf, uh, Aguilera, he insults and kicks the dog. And you go, oh, no, yeah, he shouldn't have done that. You know, that's that's going to be a mistake. And sure enough, it, it it's funny because she ends up coming back for her revenge in a most unexpected way. Yeah, it was a Chekhov's gun, too. It was, I, I literally wrote down the rubber shark is the Chekhov's gun, which I didn't see that coming that, you know, speaking of how elements of this film were so predictable, that was something I never would have predicted right. that, that would have ended up being the Chekhov's gun to the movie, <laughs> which ironically makes it the perfect Chekhov's gun. Yeah, because but movies, especially from this era, didn't tend to be very subtle about their Chekhov's gun. It would very much be in your face and it's going to come back later. And you just knew that. So, yeah. Cause see, they, I think they did a good job of subverting that with uh, the Godzilla scene because they have all the movie props and you think, Oh, okay. The reason why the movie stuff is there is to give the, the twins that job so that they could bring in the Godzilla scene. So they could have that security thing. So they could beat at the docks. It gives them that reason to be there. And you just think, the foam is just a, a visual gag on Jaws. Right. Yeah. And that's exactly once you've gotten that Godzilla joke in it, it you kind of feel like the movie that's being made in the town, which isn't a major focus of uh, the plot. You kind of feel like that movie, it, it served its purpose. Now we got the Godzilla joke out of it. I didn't expect it to come back a second time, but we also get the ultimate kind of final say with the dog storyline and squid storyline because Bosco gets to have a, a, a litter of mangy cone headed <laughs> oh puppies God, so cute. <laughs> just waddling down the dock which is the strangest thing <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a vis good visual gag but there's no feasible explanation I could think of for why they would all the puppies would have little mangy cones too 
Oh, right. No, there's no, it's just the visual <laughs> gag, but that's, but that's part of this movie. I mean, there's so many things. What's, what's interesting to me about this movie is that it is kind of this weird mashup of just nonsensical things like that. And a plot line that because it, well, maybe it's because it has John Cusack, but maybe it's just because it's a good story, but a storyline that actually has some heart to it and some, uh, some substance to it. Yeah. As I said, I liked this. I had a lot of fun watching it. I'm I'm glad you brought it up because I, I don't think I would have – as I said, in my head, I kept mixing it up with Summer School for some mm-hmm. reason, which is a different movie, and I I had never seen it and had kind of gone out of my way. Well, I just hadn't gone out of my way to see it, I guess, is right. the better thing. And it wasn't like I was avoiding it. I just – but I enjoyed watching it. This was Go fun. Ahead. Pulling up the mini gags. Did you notice the guy who died at the graduation? Is he dead? Uh, yeah, he's dead. Oh, that's even more tragic because that reminded me of something. <laughs> oh, I thought it was I'm sorry. Asleep. No, when I well, when I had my high school graduation, we had one guy there who my family commented to me when the graduation ceremony was over with that he was so drunk, and this was a, a high schooler. Uh, he was so drunk that they had spent half the ceremony just watching him kind of keep leaning over, and they were just waiting to see if he was going to make it through the ceremony or pass out and mm-hmm. hit the ground uh and and tragically he he died a couple of years ago so the when i when everybody else got up i thought the guy was sleeping i didn't realize he's dead that that makes it a little more tragic yeah so the <laughs> the, the the sharp hat goes down into the back of the spinal cord and he does the the heavy body death slump so it's oh. never stated that he died but the implication was that he's either dead or paralyzed. And- God, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. I, uh, You know, again, my first time seeing it, so I'm not going to catch all yeah. the, the gags. I feel like it was supposed to be a the, – the, sh- the hat's just so freaking sharp. They're so pointy. Like, no lie, when I graduated high school, me and my best friends, we were frisbeeing them at each other like ninja stars because they were just so stupidly sharp, which was, I know, a dumb thing to do, but, you know, <laughs> we just a bunch of 18-year-olds at that point. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we had a explicit no throwing your caps <laughs> rule. Oh, both both at the high school I attended and at the high school that I taught at, it was explicit. In fact, at the high school that I taught at, we had to go around before graduation and make sure everybody had written their names in their caps specifically so that if they threw them, we could find out who did it. Oh, that's such a bummer. Well, and every year I kept thinking, what are you going to do? They graduated it and the school year's over with. Like that was the last thing that teachers had to do. We had exams and then we had teacher work days and then graduation was literally the last thing you did. And then the school year was over for the teachers. And all I could think is if they do throw the cap, what are you going to do? You can't give them detention for next year. Yeah, but they do technically have the power to withhold the diploma. I think they'd be standing on thin ice trying to do that. Yeah, I, I think- no, I don't think it'd like hold up, but they do technically have that power. Uh, I yeah, uh, okay, I guess. <laughs> No, there's not a judge in the world that would be like, really? Y'all want to go through with this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let me see what else I got in my notes. Uh, Ang Shu. Ang Shu. Yeah, Teddy's trained in Ang Shu, the martial art oh my of gosh. disemboweling I... with popsicle sticks. Yeah, so I that, I didn't recognize that because it's obviously, or at least I don't think it's real. So No, it's not real. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't recognize the name at first because it's so – it's such a small and obscure part of the movie. But it made me laugh. It, it cracked me <laughs> it up. Was, it's funny. It's funny because it's ridiculous. It's a – even as a morbid image, it's ridiculous to think of someone doing that with a popsicle stick. But there's so many morbid images in this. I mean if if the guy is dead at graduation, then you've got it pretty much from the opening scene. Uh, when they first go looking for their friend Aki – Played by Curtis Armstrong, he's collecting shells. I mean, the the movie opens up with the the rhino shooting the fuzzy bunnies. That's true. That's true. But he's collecting shells on the beach, and it's mortar shells <laughs> under fire. <laughs> right <laughs> under fire. <laughs> so it's it's lots of things like that thrown in. And again, they don't have to. He would have had a good movie without them. But I don't think there's any problem with throwing all that stuff in there to for laughs. I think they add a lot. And I, I say this in the mindset of 10 to 11-year-old me. That movie was one of the few movies I actually enjoyed. Because I'm not a big movie person. I don't enjoy sitting still and watching something for several hours because my ADHD makes that very hard for me. I have to have some kind of interaction with it. So for me, 
that movie was great because there were so many jokes that it was like watching a comedy routine and a story. I, I never was bored watching that movie like I was bored watching other things. Yeah, you'd have a hard time being bored watching this movie <laughs> if you're paying attention. <laughs> couple other gags that I really liked that I wanted to mention. The dinner at Grandma's house. Oh, with the check. And she presents <laughs> hoops with a check. <laughs> I like that she asked him if he wanted anything else first. Y- yes. Yeah. Can I get you anything else? Oh, no. I'm. That's fine. I've had enough. Okay. And she puts that down in front of him. And everybody else looks away like, uh, you're, you're going to take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. The grandma. Uh, she only had th- three appearances on screen. Right? She had when they first got there, the gas station, and then the dinner. Right. Right. And she managed to be a character in all of them. Oh, well, Billy Bird, who plays that character, it has such a a long list of credits. Always playing, especially later in her life, those those kinds of, you know, comedic jabs type roles, you know, where you she's going to say the unexpected or she's going to you know, get something in there, but she's especially television. She, she did so much stuff. I didn't realize she was in home alone. How about that? But yeah, I mean, she's, so as soon as I saw her, I was like, okay, well, she's going to steal the scenes. And sure enough, (laughs) sure enough, she did. They really got the most out of John Cusack's stunt double. You know, I'll be honest. I didn't recognize the stunt double. No, I'm just saying how many times did they have him falling down stairs or a hill or that, you know, the tumbling that that couldn't have been Kuzak himself. That had to have been a stunt double. Uh, Maybe. I I don't know. I see not all stunt doubles are noticeable, but I typically realize when a stunt double is on screen, like when the biker went off the edge. So I kind (laughs) of wonder if that was or wasn't a stunt double for John Kuzak. Oh, maybe. They did so many tumbles. It just is. Uh, that was my comment was that, you know, they, they again, it's come something. It's one of those that he throws it in there as often as he can. So he falls down the hill. He falls downstairs. Right. It's a very, you know, you, you made the comment about not being able to watch movies because of your, your ADHD. It, it's a very ADHD kind of movie. In be- it's all over the place. Yeah. It jumps around so much, but it's fun. I still, I had fun with it. All right, anything else you want to chat about before we go to the closing credits here? The only other thing I would think about mentioning is the uh, the hilarity of the plane crash, air quote, scene with the Boy Scouts. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Remember, your victims cannot think for themselves. Do not listen to anything they say. That's incredible with the, the children just running after them with gauze. Yeah, and I loved that, the <laughs> way that. That led up to that conflict at the Dewdrop Inn, but the way the the different characters ended up there. So you have Cookie and Hoops being chased by the scouts. You have Teddy making his way there because there was the phone call. You have Godzilla going there because he's got to warn Hoops. And yeah, I mean, it's just the sequence of events that leads up to that scene of conflict was hilarious. It was so entertaining to watch the different pieces being moved into place for that. Yeah. All right, so the algorithm says this is kind of a lightning round. This is uh, movies that various algorithms say you will like because you liked One Crazy Summer. Oh, I need to write this down then, huh? <laughs> so it's kind of lightning responses. You know, have you seen these movies? Do you like these movies? Do you wonder why the hell they're connected to, to One Crazy Summer? Okay. Um, you know, it's just it's just quick reactions. All right. Uh-huh. Uh, so Better Off Dead. I haven't seen it. Haven't seen it. It comes from the same. It's John Cusack and Savage Steve. And I I think this is the better movie over Better Off Dead, personally. All right. Summer School. Haven't seen it. That's the one I keep saying I get mixed up with this one. That's Mark Harmon. Right. Right. Summer Rental. Haven't seen it. (laughs) I'm noticing a trend here. (laughs) All right. Say anything. Uh, I can't. I don't think I've seen that one. I think I have to see the cover. Oh, uh, that's that's the iconic John Cusack holding up the boom box. Oh, you know what? I've Peter seen Gabriel that. Scene. I haven't seen the whole movie. Oh, God. I love that movie. It's such a good movie. All right. Joe versus the volcano. No, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen it. I have no idea how it's linked to this one other than <laughs> it's got other than it's got a solid story, but it's got a lot of little weird quirks thrown in as well. But it's not at the same level as this one. All right, Real Genius. Nope. Haven't seen that one either? No. Oh, wow, okay. One more, Revenge of the Nerds. 
I think I saw that a very long time ago. My mom probably showed it to me about the same time as this movie. Gotcha. Okay. Well, now you have a shopping list of movies that you need to go check out. <laughs> yeah, Joe vs. the Volcano. I'm looking at that right now. Let's it's see. Tom Hanks. It's considered to be one of Tom Hanks' worst films. Oh, that automatically makes me excited. It's a very divide. Most people have a very divided response to it. Either they love it or they hate it. So um, one of the other podcasts I listened to just did an episode. Uh, they do best. Uh, they do like a, a good movie and a bad movie every week. And Joe versus the volcano was their bad movie. And I sat listening to it going, no, you're wrong. <laughs> one thing I'll say is that my, the easiest kind of movie for me to watch is kind of those B list movies like Sharknado movies that have, a lot of terrible production or they're just kind of so bad they're good kind of things. That's kind of the movies that I can really enjoy. Well, from that list, I, I would highly recommend Say Anything. Uh, it, it is not a, a much of a comedy. It is mm -hmm. it is drama, and it's about finding love. Uh, Joe versus the Volcano, I like. Uh, Real Genius is – that. that's one you need to see. That's early, early Val Kilmer. Real so genius. those. Yeah, those three I would highly recommend. Uh, Real Genius is child prodigy going to a college, and Val Kilmer plays a guy who kind of used to be a child prodigy, and now he's more about having fun. And so it's it's a comedy set at college. It's a coming of age story, kind of like this is. Okay. So I I I like that one a lot. I'll definitely give that one a look because I I really like the coming of age plot line. It resonates with me. Well, you're still coming of age yourself, so right. <laughs> Well, actually, that's more true than you know because I was pre-med for a long time, and I ended up finding out the hard way that that just was not the path for me, and I thought it was what I wanted, and then I realized it wasn't what I wanted, and I had absolutely no idea what to do and what to fall back on. <laughs> I know that feeling. As I said, I went I went back to college in my late 20s for my English degree, so I, I totally understand. All right, we always end with the pop quiz for questions that are related to the movie that you've chosen. Oh, gosh, I should have studied. <laughs> All right, here we go. Number one, the cast is full of actors who went on to large comedic careers, but which actor and former roommate to John Cusack made his debut in One Crazy Summer? Oh, this is really bad because I don't know actor names. Do you have a multiple choice? <laughs> yes, it is multiple choice. Uh, a, Bobcat Goldthwait, who plays Egg. Mm -hmm. B, Tom Villard, who plays Clay. C, Jeremy Piven, who plays Ty, or D, John Matzerak, who plays Stain. Is it Jeremy Piven? It is Jeremy Piven. Very wow, good. I, I did not know that. That's a guess. I took C. <laughs> uh, in fact, Joel Murray thought that he wasn't going to get cast in this. He thought Jeremy Piven was going to get the role of Gordon. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Man, that's a weird thought in my head. Because now I'm putting that character in the Gordon situations, and that's just weird. I don't think it would have worked as well. I think no, the it really wouldn't well have. He, he looked too preppy. Like they would have had to do something with his hair, different clothes. And he goes on to play, uh, you know, his major role that most people know him for is Ari Gold on Entourage, which is, you know, a grown up preppy essentially. So, mm -hmm. all right, number two, Curtis Armstrong's character Ak Ak is a reference to what two things? So your answer is going to be two of these. All right. Okay. A, military jargon for anti-aircraft fire. B, one of the cantina creatures in Star Wars. C, the designation for the Nantucket airport. Or D, a species of fish found off the coast of Nantucket. I want to say the Star Wars character in the airport. Uh, we got one right. It is the airport, okay. which is A-C-K. A a was it the one with fire? Yeah, it's the anti-aircraft anti fire in military jargon is Akak. -Ak. So that's and that makes sense with his dad being such a yeah. military minded person. He wants that character to go into the the Marines, I think it is. All right, number three, Savage Steve Holland used the animated sequences to enact a form of retribution against a couple of people he felt had wronged him. Ooh. Who were they? A Better Off Dead stars John Cusack and Amanda Wiss. B One Crazy Summer stars John Cusack and Demi Moore. C, his producing partners, Michael Jaffe and Gil Frierson, or D, film critics, Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel. I want to say the film critics. You're absolutely right. Because it seemed like he was attacking someone that had torn out his heart, honestly. 
Yeah, Gene's, uh, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert had given very negative reviews to Better Off Dead, and so the two of the bunnies at the end of the movie, when they're really getting very blown distinctly up and stuff, people shaped, they they look specifically like Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel. Okay. All right. Last question. After poor returns for his theatrical projects, Holland moved to the world of television. Most notably, he created and produced what iconic Fox Kids character? A, Eek the Cat, B, Super Dave, C, Plucky Duck, or D, Carmen Sandiego? I don't think it was Carmen Sandiego. I don't remember who did that, but I want to say it was Plucky Duck. No, Plucky Duck is uh, derived from the Looney Tunes characters. Okay. You want to take a second guess? Uh, I'm just going to go with my gut and go back to Carmen Sandiego. That's probably not right. No, Carmen Sandiego is uh, adapted from a video game series. It was Eek the Cat. The other, th- the, I tried to give that one to you. The other three characters are all derived from other things. So, oh, okay. Uh, the only one they could have created was Eek the Cat. That's which fair. Is, which he did. So. All right. Um, I don't know if you have much of an online presence. Is there somewhere people can find you or anything you want to promote while you're here? Um, be nice to people. Be nice to people. <laughs> I don't have much of an online presence. Hi, Mom. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you for introducing me to One Crazy Summer. It, it may not be the best movie in the world, but it's a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed watching it. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate getting to talk about it with someone. You know, big part of my childhood. So that does it for this week, but you can keep the conversation going throughout the week on social media. You can find me at Town Hess on Twitter or the show at Have Not Seen This on Twitter. On Facebook, we are at Have Not Seen This Podcast or email me at Have Not Seen This at gmail.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes, including next week's episode where I finally take the red pill and see just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Positive ratings and reviews are always welcome, as is just sharing the podcast with a friend and spreading the love. And if you like World of Warcraft or other Blizzard games, be sure to check out my other podcast, Citizens of Azeroth, a World of Warcraft podcast, also available through all major podcast sources. Special thanks to Chris Talent for our wonderful theme song, and thanks to Michael Copeland for providing this week's conversation. Maybe you have a movie you'd like to talk about, one that means something to you or you're particularly astonished when you discover people have not seen. Well, come be a guest on the show. Head over to havenotseenthis.podbean.com, click the Be a Future Guest button, submit the form there, and I'll get you set up for a future episode. Until next week, I'm Rave Telsh, and this has been Have Not Seen This.